Today is Monday, August 24th, 2020. My name is Matthew Simmons. I'm interviewing Javier Tavera for the Voss's Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, please know, Mr. Tavera, that this interview will be placed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection at UT Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there's something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record your consent. So I'll ask you a series of five questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree, after each one. There are two questions we need to make sure you agree on before we go forward, okay? Uh, Voss's wishes to archive your interview along with any photographs and other documentation at the Benson Library at UT Austin. We will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to Voss's. Do you give Voss's consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Benson Library? Yes, I agree. Okay. Do you grant Voss's copyright over the interview and any material you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow us to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, there's a couple more, but those are the important ones. <laughs> okay. We have many questions in a pre-interview form that we have already filled out. We use that information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure Voss's server. Before we send it to the Benson, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members. So that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at the Benson? Yeah, yes, I agree. On occasions, Vosses receives requests from journalists who wish to conduct our interview to contact, rather, our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone number or your email with journalists? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I agree. Thank you very much for answering those questions. Okay, now we can do the interview part. Excellent. All right. Thank you again for taking time to meet with me. Uh, we'll start out with some just basic, um, you know, information. If you want to tell me a little bit about yourself, that's always a great place to start. Mm -hmm. um, again, my name is Javier Tavera. I, I was born in Mexico City. I emigrated to the United States in 1996. Uh, and I did so um, uh, in a very particular way. A company from Texas hired me to do some industrial photography in Houston for two months. I did so, and at the end of my contract, I they asked me to um, to keep doing the same work in Minnesota. Apparently they were going to make a, the headquarters were going to be here and a bigger facility was going to be placed north of Minneapolis, about four hours. And uh, they promised uh, to arrange my papers, my legal documentation to be in this country. And they also promised to uh, a salary and to pay for my school. Back then, I was studying law in Mexico City. I was on my third year. And I dropped everything at, after the two months of work in Houston. I moved in September of 96 to, uh, to Minnesota. Uh, right away by 97, I was enrolled at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And uh, by the end of 97 or 90, uh, the beginning of 98, the company went bankruptcy and everybody fled, fled. And I decided to keep on studying. So um, I kept it going all the way to 98, where my debt was <laughs> all the way to the ceiling. and. Being an international student, 
it was pretty much double. So um, the Minneapolis College of Art and Design were great on allowing me to keep on going until they told me, you're just gonna bury yourself in debt. So I maybe it's a time to, to quit and continue later on. And I did, I dropped out and uh, I started to arrange my legal papers here. I got an H-1B. I got actually two H-1Bs after my student visa. And then I got a series of H-1Bs year by year. Uh, by 2002, I was um, already living with my uh, girlfriend, now my wife, Maria Cristina Tavera. And uh, in 2009, 2007, geez, I'm going to forget if she hears me, she's going to kick my ass. Um, I got married and um, um, Reg, uh, make my, my status here regular. Um, all these years, actually since I was 13 years old, I've been photographing. Uh, that is how I see the world, how I cope with uh, living and transitions and um observing it has been uh, a key tool for me and uh, documenting what i see um by um when was it 2012 my wife tricked me into going back to school. Uh, she hijacked my email and she wrote the Minneapolis College of Art and Design saying that, uh, posting uh, of like, like if it, it was me. And she said, I wanna go back to school. Two days later, I received a letter from them um, saying, we're very excited that you are thinking about coming back to school. And I'm like, what? Uh, I said, Tina, these people are calling me to have an interview. So they apparently think that I want to go back to school. And she said, well, by the way, you know, the other night that you left your the computer and your email open, I went in there and I wrote them. Uh, so I threw a fit and I said, no, I'm not going to go back. And I don't believe in education. This is a bunch of uh, waste of time. And uh, of course I went there. If you knew my wife, you know, I, I, I went there. And um, I applied, they offered me a full scholarship and I was able to go back to school right away. Um, I did two more years at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design and right away I applied to the master's program at the University of Minnesota. Uh, through all this time, I had uh, a job at um, Granite Quartz Fabrication Plant that allowed me flexibility to keep doing my art. Um, so it was a great opportunity to leave that job behind and to pursue uh, master's degree uh, that is more aligned with art and uh, had the possibility of me becoming and sharing what I know. Um, so I'm a, a faculty right now at the, at the University of Minnesota um, where I think I am marketable to being a, a professor and a teacher and uh, also do uh, some social service in there. That's great. Wow, there's, 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 there's a lot there. And I've got other questions too that I've got to ask you about. Um, I will ask you to go back 
a little bit. And uh, usually I, I talk more when I engage with people, but since it's an oral history, you'll see me nodding most of the time. So just, just you know, understand that um, because the noises, you know, if I say, mm-hmm, that comes through, um, you know, in the transcript and then transcriptionists, they don't like that. Um, so when you found out about that initial job when you were in Mexico City studying law, how did you even know about that opportunity that was in Texas? Were you looking for that kind of opportunity? Um, I was doing some odd jobs uh, as a commercial photographer, and I wanted to incur in uh, the industrial photography. Um, I was photographing by, back then dance and theater troupes. And uh, so uh, many people knew that I was engaged in photography and um, they called me and they, they asked me if I wanted to do this. And uh, I interrupted my studies there because it paid very well and I wanted to upgrade some equipment. So I thought this is the, the best opportunity that I have to, in a short time, just uh, earn some money, pay for my equipment and keep on photographing. Uh, since the beginning, the work, work aspect of photography has been, I, I have made a very defined line between the commercial aspect of photography and my practice as a docu documentarian um, and artwork. So it was, it was pretty much a, a gig. It was a job um, that could sustain the other part of what I do. That is really going into deep to interview people, to photograph people, and uh, to disseminate the information that I compiled through these interviews and portraits. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, when I asked for, uh, you know, additional you know, photos and things like that. Obviously, your art is, is something that they would love to have in, in, in you know, the collection, um, thing, things of that nature. Um, that makes perfect sense. And then uh, one other follow-up question, and then I'll get into the, you know, the list of questions that we have. Mm -hmm. um, had you expressed a desire to go back to school over the years that your spouse had kind of picked up on, or was that something that she just felt would, would benefit you? And, and she... Um, you know, just decided to take a lot of initiative in, in, in propelling you in that direction. I did express some thoughts about going uh, back to school to finish that. I was reluctant to do that because I was photographing, I was making contacts, I was uh, having exhibitions, I, have, I was having a couple publications, uh, a museum the Minneapolis Institute of Art acquired some of my pieces. So part of me thought, I don't need a paper that tells me who I am. It's not part of my identity. My identity is what I do as a documentarian photographer. Uh, but in the other part, I, I had a very crappy uh, fabricating job at a, at a factory. Uh, a lot of responsibility, I was doing measuring uh, for an end product, and it was a uh, dead end job. It was um, nothing that I I wanted to pursue further. I mean, I could have you know pushed it further and be a manager of of, of that um, company, and but that didn't interest me that much. I wanted a job that can supplement, that can pay the rent, the mortgage, pay for the car, and allow the allow me the time to do my photography and pursue um, you know a little bit of grant writing get um, some funding through there but really going to dip into different communities and and tell those stories that's the 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 final right the final means of of this so um, education was uh, maybe an outlet that I can, that I could uh, do. Uh, two institutions at the time when I didn't have the credentials, they were asking me to teach. One was Metro State and the other one was 
Osborg University. Metro State, as soon as I told them that I didn't have a master's, they said like, I, we cannot do anything, we're sorry. You know, uh, finish your studies and come back to us. But Osborg University, uh, one of the, the instructors, Susan Beecher, asked me if I wanted to teach. And yes, I told them, yes, I, I, I would love to. I was already doing uh, little workshops with nonprofits and, and whatnot, but I do not have the credentials to teach at that level. And she says, let's do something. Let's do a co-teaching uh, semester where you're gonna teach, I'm gonna leave you, right? And then have that experience and let's see what happens. And I, I took the opportunity. She was great. She's now a very good friend of mine. And all of a sudden, I, um, I thought that I could, could um, put my two cents for people's education, that I could um, share what I know. And um, photography is not only technical stuff. It's not only um, chemicals in the dark room and programs if you're going to do digital. Photography is really about, about how you live, uh, how you express yourself. And to transmit that to students, it's, um, it's actually a, an enormous privilege. When they really, when they come with some expectations that they, they just wanna you know, do a class because it's required and photography seems to be simpler and they have a camera and they had the curiosity to know how to use it. But when they start to see and relate to the world through a camera with images and to share that information, it opens a whole completely new world for them. And I like that very much. And uh, um, then I thought, well, this is maybe something that I can do instead of my, uh, fabrication work, my factory work. And uh, so I dove immediately at it uh, with the nice push of my wife and uh, yeah, and here I am. Okay, that's, that's great and that's exciting. Um, particularly since, you know, everyone has a camera now, right? On, the, on their phone and obviously, you know, it's not always the best device, but you've got a, a touchstone to students immediately. Completely, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I mean, it's the, the democratization of Im the image, right? The distribution. Is, is, these are exciting times for photography. People are like a little reluctant, like, well, if you have this gear or if you don't have, make these type of images. People are expressing themselves. People, you know, the grandfather with 80-year-olds that is making a little movie of his... Um, uh, family is as exciting as anything that I or any other artist can do. And I'm all for it. I just remembered something that I'll have to say. So since I have the, the free version of Zoom, we'll get cut off at the 45 minute mark, but I will call you again on Zoom and then we can pick up um, just so you don't get alarmed when that happens. I just realized that. Okay. It's happening in like five minutes. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just so you know. Um, Zoom is, is funny like that. So um, now we're going to kind of dig a little more deeply into kind of, kind of COVID and your experience with that, um, mm -hmm. since that's one of the overarching topics. So how did you first learn about COVID-19? Um, I heard of it. Um, I heard of it before uh, leaving to um, one of my projects in, at the border. I've been photographing along the border for almost three years or past three years now. And uh, one of the projects that I'm very interested in right now is um, documenting and interviewing the deported veterans. So I was, I went to, to Tijuana in March, of, the, of this year, 2020, and um, 
um, I went there, they, they opened the doors for me. I did uh, the portraits that I wanted to do. I did a whole day of interviews. And then I took off uh, east all the way to um, Quito, Baquito in Arizona, uh, Ajo. And on my way back, I started to hear that this was a serious issue. Um, so on my way back from San Diego to Minneapolis, uh, I got that concern, right? That uncomfortable, um, uncomfortableness about being enclosed in a plane and everybody seemed a little nervous as well. Uh, we, I mean, not that we know much about uh, COVID right now, but we knew less then. Um, there were like one, two um, detected cases in Mexico and one or two detected cases in the United States. Um, and when I came back, um, you know, checking, checking regularly how I felt and right away, uh, that was on spring break for the, the, the the university and then when we came back, well, we actually didn't come back. We uh, transitioned to um, classes in the computer and it started more, more information, more cases um, started to, to arise. So yeah, somewhere around there, I learned uh, how, how critical was the, 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 the pandemic. Okay, great. And uh, in terms of its impact on you, I guess this pertains to your teaching, maybe particularly, um, you know, what kind of daily impact has COVID had on you, I guess, personally and or professionally? Um, so professionally, I, I came back from, from Tijuana and uh, they, uh, it was, a week that we could transition into distance learning. And the rest of the semester, we did it online. And I was thinking how important it is right now to learn photography. There are really more important things in, in the student's life right now. Uh, some of them are back to their parents, some of them are stranded in the dorms, some of them, uh, I mean, we're all scared. So what I did is going and pushing back uh, the, about the, the administration at the, at the University of Minnesota that said not to have many um, um, synchronous, lectures, I did them all synchronous. And I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to put some normalcy into the student's life. Um, we are all scared. We don't know if we should go out or not. We should stay at home. Uh, but what, that, what does that mean? So I had them do three very simple assignments and we will meet on regular, one hour instead of three, but in, in regular um, class time. And um, and and by that, trying to put some normalcy into their lives and also mine, right? It's time to wake up, it's time to take a shower and it's time to be ready for class. And you have to be on time and I'm gonna take attendance and you have to be engaged. And I really don't care if, right, if you have a sleepy face and you haven't showered, but I need to see your face and you need to be engaged. And the assignments are going to be photograph one time a day, photograph anything in your dorm, in your apartment, in your parents' house, wherever you are, and make a diary. Because this is historical. And this is historical for your personal history as well. So take a photo. We counted how many sessions we're, we were going to have. And uh, they took a series of, of photos of that. I asked them uh, 
to take photos in nature. So they will go out, either right, take a plant in their apartment or go to the garden or to the yard to take some images or go to a park or go to a national park. So to push them out their houses um, so they can have fresh air and they move around. And um, I think it actually worked because I, I uh, you know, we were right in the middle of it and I gave them the option to my two classes. I say, okay, we can still do this and meet two times a week or uh, we can meet uh, not so regularly and uh, you know, you, I, you can, uh, we can handle it some other way. And immediately all of them said like, no, no, we are gonna meet face to face. We're gonna meet, well, not face to face, like we're gonna meet all together. And uh, they were very thankful for me for doing that because all of their other classes, they didn't have any human contact. They were watching some videos, making notes, um, making a test online. And that really put things in perspective uh, and, and put some normalcy into the daily life. So that's the work part. My um, practice as a photographer, it also changed because I, uh, most of the work that I do is with people. I, I do portraits and interviews. So um, I couldn't do that anymore. Uh, but what I did is I decided to do a project in my block and uh, I got out a call. I called the project 10 feet portraits. So um, any neighbor that would agree to have their picture taken, all the family will come out to the front door and 10 feet apart, I will put my tripod, I will climb on a ladder and I photograph them and have a little conversation, right? About this new normal, about these new ways uh, that we were all trying to figure out. And it was very interesting. I still, um, I think in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna share all the findings with all the neighbors and I photograph about uh, 16, 16 families. And that also gave me some normalcy and gave, they gave them, the project gave my, my neighbors also some kind of face-to-face um, -face contact with somebody. Um, so, um, yeah, my practice has changed a little bit. Uh, now I'm photographing objects, um, treating them as much care as I would do with a portrait but um, yeah, it's a change, has changed a while. Um, but all, you know, challenging times are gonna, are gonna bring challenging opportunities too. So how to adapt to them, I think is important. Right, right. That's great. You, you've got so much, so much in there that I could ask you follow-up questions about. I've gotta be very targeted. Um, so these uh, student projects, I guess that you had them doing, when things changed in the spring, uh, was there anything surprising, photos that they took, something that just made you really um, think deeply about what they were doing or made you surprised that they would take a photo of this and why it might be significant? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think it was as, as surprising for me as it was for them. Because all of a sudden, right there in a very uh, enclosed space and I'm asking them to take interesting images and their mind is somewhere else, right? Their, their mind is how are they gonna get food? What's gonna happen with the classes? How can they get back home if they're not home, if they're gonna move, right? And all of a sudden they want, I, I, I'm trying them to forget all that and focus on the present. Um, I, I, I talked to them about the monkey brain and the monkey brain, according to who knows who or just me, is this brain that jumps and wants to jump everywhere, right? Past, 
future and it's jumping all the time. So in a way to control that monkey brain, you have to calm it down and set it in, into the present. So it doesn't jump on what are they gonna do next? How are they gonna solve things? Or what has happened before that they haven't solved, right? Is present and present only. And through photography, they, they can photograph their slippers, their collection of CDs, their books, their whatever they have, and all of a sudden locks them in the present about composing and doing that. And that was a great exercise. Um, I'm sorry, I went somewhere else. Uh, you were talking to me about, oh, the surprises. Yes, absolutely. So we got a chance also for them to show what they were doing. And some of the images were um, absolutely stunning. It was, they, they were great uh, with the resources and the environment, the confined environment that they were living in. Uh, it's a little bit of escape from that confinement and then share that with everybody else. So it was, it was very interesting. And also these, these are, um, some of the students are super courageous. I had a, 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 a Chinese student that disappeared for two weeks and uh, I was concerned emailing her constantly. And after two weeks, she told me that uh, she was, um, she went back home and she had to be quarantined in a hospital for two weeks. And then from there, she was going to be quarantined in a hotel for another two weeks. And then she will go home and quarantine for another two weeks. And I told her, eh, you know, crappy Wi-Fi, bad communication, all that stuff. And at the end, she was complying with all the assignments. And she sent me some beautiful landscapes of uh, the region that she lives in. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's, that's incredible. Even with those very strict, very, very strict confinement, um, she was able to, in transition, do the assignment and uh, come up with, you know, a wonderful set of images. So, yeah, it is. It has been. It has been super interesting. Good. Um, let's see where, where to go after that. That's really all very good. Um, your uh, stepchildren are they? Are they school age? Are they working? Are they um, in college or? Uh, my young, my young kid. They are in Tacoma, Washington, and finishing their fourth the fourth year uh studying geology oh that's great okay. uh, and my other kid is here in minneapolis uh very active in food distribution he works in a youth farm coordinating and uh, farming he studied biology also in tacoma washington and uh yeah both of them are wonderful kids, you know, struggling still with, uh, with, with COVID and, and what does it mean for them and their lives, but yeah, coping with it. Sure. And, and so the one that's in school in, in Washington, the, the educational impact that, that uh, that child has experienced, has that been similar to, to what you've seen as a, uh, as a professor or has it had been, has it been very different? From their perspective, what they've told you, I think is I think is actually it has been very interesting because uh, the new semester will start in a couple of weeks, and uh, I decided to do it face to face. They gave me a shield, they gave me a mask, and I have two um, two classes that are going to be face to face. And some of the kids have been asking if I'm gonna turn it to online or not. And right now it's all uncertain. But at the same time, uh, my kid in Tacoma is asking the same questions and asking their professors um, 
the similar similar questions and saying how can that this this be right they want us to be face to face and it's not safe and i'm having that same conversation with my students right to try trying to answer her answer they their questions it, it has been it has been tricky um it's like okay you have to have patience and you have to not everybody has all the technology to give a face-to-face -face, face class and also an online class at the same time. And uh, um, they are fighting like, well, no, I'm gonna, right? I don't wanna go back to school. I don't feel safe and, uh, right? So having this conversation, it has been also seeing it from a student's perspective, not only from my perspective, right? And that, that has been a very interesting. Right, you have multiple points of vision that you can kind of engage with. So you, you, you occupy a very unique um, position for sure. So your decision to teach um, in person, so it, it sounds like that was something you volunteered to do, that you wanted to do. Maybe you could talk a little bit about why you wanted to kind of take that route. Because right, the risk is, is higher, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you teach in person than, than if, you're, if you're doing it remotely. So there were a couple things that, uh, you know, solidify my decision. Uh, solidify uh, is a little, still a little muddy, not, not like concrete solidify. But um, I had the opportunity to teach uh, online. Um, I am not super eloquent. English is my second language and um, I need that that presence for me to transmit everything that I that I want to transmit to the student. That's one, and that's per, a personal one. Two, the students were writing to me saying, "Are you going to be face to face? I really want to do face to face because we have of the same course we have seven iterations. It's a big school, and they can they can choose right which classes they can do. You know." face to face, which ones they can do online. And the third one, uh, a couple months ago, this government administration um, put out some restrictions on international students. And that was really a concern to me. And the, uh, the administration said, well, if you are having certain percentage of, um, if the international students have a certain percentage of classes face to face, they can stay, otherwise they have to leave the country. And I say like, screw it. I, I am gonna be present also for that reason. So they can have the opportunity to stay here and to choose the class and then to have that experience. Uh, that, um, that was taken away. They retracted that policy and uh, the international students can can be here e either if it's face-to-face um, uh, -face or, or online. Um, so it was all, a little bit countering that, right? You're gonna do that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my part. I have a, 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 a good percentage of international students and I, you know, I, I wanna support them. I wanna uh, be there for them um, and uh, and then, yeah, here we are, two, two weeks, and we're going to start. And actually, today, uh, I'm, I'm teaching another two classes at, at Carleton College, and they are requiring everybody to, uh, to be tested. So after, after the interview, I'm running to Northfield to um, be tested. OK, OK. Interesting. Yeah, I'm at the University of South Florida, but I'm not in the teaching role, so so I'm I'm fully remote. But I I, I admire your willingness to to engage with students like that. I, I would agree. I, I like teaching students face to face, but since I'm not teaching right now, it's not not an issue um, for me. So uh, has it changed how you're doing healthcare? Um, COVID nineteen has it changed any? I guess how you go to doctors' appointments or anything of that nature. Well, uh, um, to tell you the truth, I, uh, I'm super reluctant to, you know, to go to any doctor or clinic or anything like that. And now even more, 
I mean, of course, if I get something, right, I'm going to follow all the procedures. Um, but let me tell you, in March, my father-in-law uh, got sick. Uh, he thought it was the heart. So he drove himself to the clinic and then uh, me and my wife rushed to, to the clinic. Um, when something like that happens, he doesn't want any help. So we were sneaking, waiting for him in the parking lot, right? And then uh, while we were waiting in the parking lot, uh, my wife called her father and he said, what, you're here? No, that's it, I'm leaving. And it's not like, no, we're just here to just, you know, be here with you, whatever. So he's coming slowly in the street and I say, well, I'm gonna go there and help him. And then he's like, I'm not moving. He's gonna yell at you. It's like, well, let's see, right? Right in the middle of the street, he looked at me and he said, I think I'm gonna need some help. I think I'm gonna need a wheelchair. So I rushed to the hospital, grab a wheelchair, went out, carry him. And the surprise thing is that usually when, uh, you know, I've been in one of these facilities, you go in without a problem. Now, uh, we went to the first door and the second door was closed. Uh, a voice in an intercom told us like, okay, who's gonna go in? What, what are their, their symptoms? Uh, fever, this and that. Um, and then a person masked and heavily geared came out and said, you cannot come in. You have to wait if you want to wait in the parking lot is fine, but he's the only one that can go in. So they wheel him in by himself. So that was the first surprise. Um, and then the second one, we, we spent like four hours in the parking lot. Uh, finally, he was discharged, uh, not with a heart um, thing that he thought he had, but with a res respiratory issue and uh, he was in a wheelchair and he had a mask and uh, just to see the interaction between the personnel and the people who were waiting outside the taxi driver uh, there there was a taxi driver that arrived and uh, was a little concerned because his passenger had a mask and this was early on, so he didn't know what to do. He finally took him, and then uh, we took our uh, my 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 stepfather home. Uh, he wasn't tested for COVID because the testing then was scarce, or only if if you have some kind of symptoms. And then he couldn't move for two months. He was just sleeping and eating some and going back to sleep for two months. So the family thinks that he did have COVID. He hasn't been tested. And then right now he's fine and he's telling his bad jokes that nobody laughs at. And, and that's the sign that he's doing way better. Uh, but yes, it's completely different. It's completely different. So that's the only experience that I had uh, with a, with you know, a health institution. Wow, that that's that sounds very challenging and, and frightening. I guess in, in some ways, I'm so glad that he's feeling better. Um, but two months—that's that's a long recuperation time. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why I mean, he has asthma and he has, you know respiratory complications, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's a, it, it was a concern. Okay. Well, I'm glad he's doing better, um, for sure. And you're right, when someone starts telling jokes that nobody laughs at, that's a, that's a good sign that they're feeling much, much better than they were before. Yep. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, 
let's see, has COVID-19 impacted uh, your activism? How has it impacted that in, in any way? That's a super interesting question because um, from when it started until now, right, we were being complying with everything, but we live um, about a quarter of a mile from uh, where George Floyd was murdered by the Minneapolis police. Um, and a mile from the third precinct, uh, that's the precinct where the police uh, officers belonged to and uh, was uh, three days later after George Floyd was murdered, was burned to the ground. Um, we were in the middle of it. So all of a sudden COVID became a secondary concern. Uh, so I, 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 we were there uh, in, the, in the intense uh, protesting and uh, for a whole week um, uh, there, was, there was riots and there was a lot of burning and uh, we were able to, to organize block by block to see how uh, we were going to protect the the houses from from certain rioters that were committing right for the most part the protest was peaceful and was a certain way uh, but there was a fraction of it there was a lot of people from the outside coming in and looting and and burning um, so that was a, a, a an opportunity to uh, to organize, to organize, and not only the block, also uh, uh, half a mile away, there's a, a Latino charter school, and uh, my wife organized a food shelf, and so we were working there intensely, receiving donations, giving out food, uh, organizing the food shelf, uh, getting out the word that um, food was... Um, in need and available for people. I also volunteered in one of the breweries that they converted into a food shelf. Um, when I was not doing that, I was cleaning up uh, with a broom and a, and a bag the streets of, of in the morning after the, the rioting and, and the, and the um, burns, we were picking up trash and you know, bracing ourselves for, for the night. It was, um, it was interesting. It was interesting because uh, people really got united, right? Uh, people, we were pushing for the same front, right? Um, there's not only in Minneapolis, but nationwide, there's injustices uh, and, uh, uh, police brutality and, and whatnot. And um, all of a sudden, you know, you feel, a, feel the, the need to participate and support and uh, have those conversations um, of how do we want to live and how do we want our police to behave and how do we want us to engage with each other, how um, racism, colonialism um, is like overwhelming and how do we dismantle the, those structures. So we can communicate differently, so we can approach each other differently. And, uh, you know, COVID really became a secondary problem um everybody or, or most people in the in, in the in the protest were having the precautions trying to leave some room uh, within each other wearing masks and being respectful of uh, you know everybody's space um it was there was a lot of um 
of, of uh, unrest, but I think it was very much needed uh, for us to think differently about how, how we live and what do we allow authorities to do. Um, and it's still going, still going with that, uh, you know, um, talks about displacement and homelessness and uh, most of the parks in Minneapolis have encampments of uh, homeless, homeless folks and um, it's an eye opening, right? And what's gonna happen in the winter with people that are not housed? What's gonna happen early next year when uh, people are displaced from their homes? Uh, and I'm talking not only the people who are currently without a home, but the ones that are gonna be displaced from their their homes and rental properties uh, or, or whatever. How are we as a society going to come together and 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 handle this? Um, how are we going to, to? I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting just to think in the future. How are we going to come out of this? How are we going to come out? Hopefully, we come out thinking differently. Some crazy ideas about universal healthcare, right? Is this, who would have think about that, right? If my neighbor is safe, I'm safe. If my neighbor is healthy, I'm healthy. If I'm healthy, everybody's healthy, right? Having that reci reciprocity. Um, I think it's gonna be important to imagine how are we gonna come back? What new ideas are gonna come out of this? If the, if the vaccine, you know, is to be able tomorrow, maybe there's a very good chance that we are gonna go back to the same. Now it has been three, four months and maybe it's gonna last all the way to next year. There's a very good chance this same time next year, everything is gonna be uh, a little different. But hopefully by then it has lasted long enough that we think really hard about our privileges and how to be empathetic with people and how we can help each other. Because, um, um, I mean, we're all in this together. We might not be, they were saying, we're all in the same boat. We're not in the same boat. We're, we're in different boats. Some of them have yachts, some of them have rafts, right? We're on the, the same storm. Um, but, regardless of economics, how, how are we gonna think differently? And you know, with that is not only political and uh, economical or health, it is also, I mean, is, is it gonna be worth showing art in a gallery? Is it gonna be worth making certain type of art? Is it gonna be worth communicating through those means? Is it gonna be worth uh, making some conceptual piece? Right now it seems a little in the air. Uh, I think it's, it's not a priority. Though I do think artists are of the most importance right now. Uh, to come up with new ideas, to reach out to people that we don't talk to each other, don't talk to uh, regularly, to um, come up with new ideas creatively. And also it's not exclusively for artists. I think we all are creative, but we have um, professionalized this creativity thing, right? We think it's for only a few. We are all creative and we are, cannot come up with solutions. So I think now is time to, to start thinking and to start listening to other options. That's all amazing. Um, <laughs> you answer my questions before I have them. Um, that's really good. Uh, let's see, I know we're almost out of time here and I wanna be respectful of your time. 
Um, let's see, what else could we see? Something really good. I mean, all of it's been really good. I'm trying to think of something that I can kind of uh, get the best, best, uh, what remains of the time. Um, hmm. Hmm. So many, so many. Maybe tell me a little bit more about your work with the uh, the food shelves that you, you've been doing. That's really interesting to me and how you've seen those needs maybe change during, during the COVID crisis and during, um, you know, kind of the economic crisis and what's been going on with, you know, the, the, the police and the Black Lives Matter movement. What's, what's your experience been there um, that you've seen? You mean specifically in the, in the food shops or, or a general take? Um, maybe start with the one and then, and then move to the, to the general. Um. It's, it, uh, the food shelves right now, um, they, they were like a, a Band-Aid. And uh, because we have an urge to get out of this and come back to some kind of normal, there were provisional. Uh, and uh, we've been pushing the notion of, of something more sustainable because, um, of course, with unrest, there was a lot of need. The combination with the unrest and COVID, uh, they, it, it put that need into another level. Uh, so there was a lot of places that were doing that. Uh, and some of them have, you know, um, diminished or, or, or died. But um, the push to think about uh, something that can be more sustainable because uh, I think we're in it for the long run. And if it's not COVID, it's going to be the economical and the repercussions of the economical, they're going to uh, put people at risk and, and with needs. So um, trying to push so these are a little more sustainable. Now there's one uh, food shelf that is every Friday. And it's actually a... Uh, a few blocks from here um, in Powder Home Park. And that seems to be a little more uh, stable and for the long run, because they've been every Friday for three, four hours, they're in there distributing food and um, everything else. So the first push was just to make them work and now there's a second push to make them sustainable and to make them the flow of um, of, um, of donations and the flow of, of people receiving them. Um, that it doesn't just, right, it's a one thing, one time deal and it's over and people have other things to, 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 to worry. Um, so, right, still, still trying to work on that. And you said your spouse has been involved in, in that as well? Um, or? Yeah. Yes, she has an enormous um, online and social media uh, following. And uh, uh, she is using that power to her benefit, to, to everybody's benefit to say, okay, this is what's gonna be, what do you need? You need volunteers to, to you know, shelf and, and move stuff. You need uh, people who donate, right? And then all of a sudden start coordinating that until it runs by itself. One, it's running, leave it to people at the school or at the park or somewhere else to, to, to keep it going. Um, so yeah, she's been instrumental in, in, in dissemin disseminating and organizing. Uh, right with with, with um, technology and social media it sounds like she's very well connected to, to the community that, that you live in yes yeah, she's very well connected so there there are different types of community right the immediate community that is the the neighborhood the 35 percent latino population that is here that's another community right and the other community that we navigate to is the artistic community that is somehow diverse and uh, you know, with, with uh, willing to help and, and whatnot. So navigating all this, those three different platforms.
Yeah, okay, great, great. Okay, so um, I guess my final question would be, is there anything else that you would want to share about your recent experiences with COVID or um, activism or anything along those lines? Anything that you want to say or talk about that we haven't talked about? Um, well, I mean, just just a comment on um, and, and, and at certain points the absurd, absurdity of um, the institutions that I work for uh, trying to go back to uh, to school, right? Um, I have concerns, even though I'm making this face to face. I have concerns about the motives of uh, why are we going back? Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it all boils down to, to economics. So, um, because of economics, we are equating and we're trying to balance economics with people's lives and health. And that's something that, that is problematic. There's no other way, there's no other reasoning that I have come up with that uh, we're going back to, to school. Um, if we lock ourselves up and come back on early January, right? I think uh, it will be it, it will be better for everybody else. Of course, I'm contradicting myself because I'm the first one who's going to be there, you know, face to face, trying to, you know, get the my classes going and trying to people to get excited about photography and art. Uh, and at the same time, it's like, hmm, why are we doing this? Why are we really doing this? Is this this is just an economic um, impulse or it has any other um, any, any other kind of solution? So yeah, so I'm 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 conflicted. Uh, I mean, as you see in my clumsy um, way of uh, saying things, um, I do not have a a, a response. I, I don't have an answer. It, this is just like free flowing me thinking about like, okay, we're doing this, but why? And if it's, is it, is it worth it? Is it only economical? So, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people in higher education have been having the same, same kinds of thoughts. Um, you know, not everybody uh, feels comfortable sharing those thoughts, right? Depending on their, their positions, you know, positions, you know, of, you know, somebody who's cleaning bathrooms may not feel like they can say anything. Um, you know, about the situation, um, whereas, you know, other folks, you know, maybe can be a little more vocal, but that's certainly... Right, and, and you know, with that in mind, uh, you know, I already talked to my TA and say, okay, whenever you feel anxious, this is a graduate kid that has a wife and a very, you know, like a two-year-old kid, and I'm like, if you don't feel safe, if you feel concerned, if you feel anxious about coming back, tell me so on. We can do something about it. You don't have to be here every day. And I want to be respectful of how you feel mentally, physically, and about your family. So, and I want to do that exact same thing with the students, right? The, the level of anxiety in students right now is absolutely crazy. Uh, you know, I receive every semester from five to seven or 10 letters from uh, the mental health office saying you have to have these uh, precautions and right, uh, you know, be lenient and, on, on this stuff. Uh, and right now, I'm assuming that got elevated enormously. So I, I, I wanna be conscious about that and uh, trying to set up a culture in, in class where they feel comfortable. They feel comfortable around each other. And if they don't, you know, I can, we can do something about that. Uh, so it's gonna be interesting. Um, 
it's gonna be it's gonna be clumsy. It's gonna be not smooth, but hopefully we can, you know, keep on going. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Professor Devera, I, I could keep talking to you for another hour because you have so many interesting ideas that I really enjoy listening to. Um, well, was there any other last last bit of um, wisdom or or um, something else that that kind of um, piqued your curiosity that you wanted to talk about? One last statement or. Or yeah, have, I, have, I, have I sucked all the <laughs> all of the wisdom out of you? Well, just one final thing that that uh, we're not gonna be like this forever, and that that should give us a lot of hope mm. that this is gonna end. And I'm, you know, very very interested in how we're gonna come out of this different, hopefully for the better. And uh, think about thinking about. Uh, I, I'm repeating myself, but thinking differently about how we live and how we relate to each other. That's great. That's that's a great note. I think to end end the interview on. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to meet with me. Um, I'll I'll let you know how things go as we kind of process the interviews. And uh, you, someone should be in touch with you. I'll probably be in touch with you at some point because I'm very interested in the work that you're doing. So I'll, I'll probably reach out to you to get some. Yeah, reach out. Feel free to reach out. Yeah. About your art, I actually attended an online art exhibit recently um, at, at USF, and they had some very interesting kind of pandemic-centered artwork. Um, and I, I do research with farm workers in particular, and there was an artist who. Um, used to be a farm worker, and his artwork centers on farm workers. Um, so you know, things things like that. I'm always always interested in. So oh, it's super interesting because I've been interested in farm in migrant farm workers too. I went uh, about a month ago. I went to Crookston, is five hours north of here. They used to have um, a lot of migrant farm workers, but technology has changed that. And the interesting part is that that, that the migrant worker is not. Um, more just farming. I interviewed um, uh, people that work with bees, mm -hmm. and they come from Mexico. They, you know, every year they, they, uh, you know, arrange their papers and they come seasonally to do that type of work. And I, I also was talking to uh, people that work in the railroad that are also Latino. And uh, so, and last year I did the same, and the Latinos that are there were working in one of these telecommunications towers. So the migrant worker has changed. It has not just stopped, it has modified. And now it's construction, and now it's beekeeping, and now it's other stuff. And I find it super, super interesting. Well, that should be another conversation because yeah. now I want to talk to you about that. And I, and I could for really about dairy farmers in Wisconsin and yeah, we can keep on going forever. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, speaking with me. Uh, we'll, we'll be in touch and please do stay safe when you start the semester. I try to. Thank you so much. You as well. Thanks okay. Man. Thank you very much, sir.